Go. No. <laughs> Genesis chapter 24. Wow, that was beautiful. Thank Amen. you. Genesis chapter 24. I want to read the first few verses of the chapter and then the last few verses of the chapter. I don't have time to read the entire chapter, even though it would be beautiful because it's one story, but it's the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. And so we're going to get the beginning and the ending, and then in our message we'll fill in the blanks. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. For you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. Now let's drop down to verse 63. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening, and he lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. Then Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. For she had said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah. She became his wife. He loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. I have a little bit of an echo. Or is, it, is it just in my head? Bring me down just a little bit. You're great. Here comes the bride. Father, we are gathering in your name. And we're enjoying your presence. You have already ministered to us and brought encouragement to our hearts. Now, give us understanding of the word. Open your word to us. And let us be blessed by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, and amen. I know there's a lot of cynicism in our society surrounding the idea of marriage. In fact, someone the other day said, marriage is like a deck of cards. It starts with two hearts and a diamond, and it ends with a club and a spade. <laughs> I heard another man this week say, well, we didn't go to the church. We got married at the Justice of the Peace, and that's the last time I saw either justice or peace. A lot of cynicism surrounding the idea of marriage. But the Bible is not cynical about married life. It's celebratory about married life. And as I mentioned, the longest chapter in the book of Genesis is devoted to this romantic, charming drama in which a bride is selected for Isaac. Mind you, only 31 verses are designated to the creation story. But here, 67 verses comprise Genesis chapter 24. Well, this was before eHarmony. This was before ChristianSingles.com. Abraham, he loved his son Isaac and determined to provide a bride for him. And so Abraham sent his trusted servant into a, a foreign land to find a lovely wife for his boy. Now, I can't imagine the kind of pressure this servant was under getting into the matchmaking business. Have you ever been involved in that? I mean, there must have been a hundred questions in his mind when he was given this assignment from Abraham. What if Isaac doesn't like the girl? 
And what if she doesn't like him? Uh, this is too much. Am I going to be charming and persuasive enough to convince anyone to accept the proposal? I heard about a, an exchange student from Germany. He was here in one of the schools of America, and he wasn't very proficient in English. And he fell in love with his English teacher. And so on Valentine's Day, he sent her a little rose with this note attached. And the note said, Dear teacher, this rose will fade and die, but my dear, you will smell forever. <laughs> well, maybe the servant felt clumsy and out of his element, going into a strange land with some pickup lines. Can you imagine the pressure? How am I going to do this? But as the story proceeds, he proves to be successful because he returns with a lovely bride for Isaac, a girl by the name of Rebecca. It's a lovely story, but we have to see in the warp and woof of the fabric the golden threads of another story, a far greater story, because this is, in fact, a gospel story. Abraham is a type of God the Father. Isaac is a type of God the Son. And the servant is likened unto the precious Holy Spirit. And of course, Rebecca is a type of the church. The gospel is all about a wedding. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. I know that Bible prophecy can get a little heavy for us sometimes because it is laden down with dark, somber, apocalyptic language, and it terrifies us. But we need to also recognize that Bible prophecy is filled with the ringing of wedding bells. Now, I know all about wedding bells this summer. As you know, Elisa got married in May, and then Abigail is getting married the first part of July. I told the girls, I said, could you not have strategized your love life a little bit better than this? Two weddings in the space of three months? What are you trying to do to me? Thank goodness I can borrow some money and, and pay for all of this. Pray for me. But it's been an exciting summer because a wedding on the horizon just changes the atmosphere. Does it not? I mean, there's just a buzz and there's the preparation and there is the planning and the shopping, and the invitations, and all the anticipation, and the engagement pictures, and it goes on and on and on. But that's what prophecy is all about. It's not just Armageddon around the corner. It's not just the Antichrist on the rise. It's not just uh, the mark of the beast being developed. But behold, the bridegroom cometh. And the church is a bridal church. And so we join the song of triumph in Revelation 19. I heard the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the wife has made herself ready. What does it mean that the wife has made herself ready? What is this process? What is this preparation? Well, we get insight as we look at Genesis chapter 24. We get insight into this process, the wife has made herself ready. Well, let's break this little story down into bite-sized pieces, and then we're going to be done. Uh, maybe five little pieces to the pie. First of all, let's talk about the sent servant. That's where we start, the sent servant. Abraham, in fact, that's how the chapter begins. Abraham was now old. How old? Old. He was now 140 years of age. He would live another 35 years. As he was 
getting up in age. I would say that's getting up in age, 140. He wants to make sure everything is set, his future is secure, and so what's looming on his mind, before he dies, he wants to find a wife for his son Isaac. Because then only then God can fulfill all of these great covenant promises that Abraham would have descendants like the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. And through this multiplicity of descendants, blessing and deliverance and salvation would come to the whole world. Now in those days and in that culture, parents selected husbands and wives and made arrangements for marriage. And so that a young lady and a young man, they would meet, marry, and learn to love one another. You know, a lot of cultures still practice that today. Not in our society. Boy, that would freak our young people out, huh? Mom and dad orchestrating the love lives of your children and picking a mate. You talk about rebellion. But I want to tell you that Abraham was quite serious about finding this bride. And so he brings in his oldest, most trusted servant and mandates him to take an oath, an oath that he would be very direct and successful in his assignment. This was probably Eliezer, but we're not given his name in the story. He's anonymous, probably to emphasize that he is likened unto the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who never draws attention to himself. In fact, Jesus said, when he comes, the Spirit, he will not speak of himself, but he will testify of me. So the servant, this anonymous servant, no name, no face, this servant sends, sent out from the Father, goes into this strange foreign country, to perform a great function. What is the Holy Spirit doing today? Oh, let me tell you that the Holy Spirit is moving throughout the world today. Every nation, every country, every tribe, every continent. He's busy. Oh, he's so busy. The Holy Spirit is moving throughout the world, building a bride for God's eternal Son. Oh, how the Father loves the Son. From all of eternity, the Son has been in the bosom of the Father, daily His delight. And God is determined to bless His Son with a gorgeous, glorious, beautiful bride. Now, not that Jesus Christ needs anything, because as one who shares the same substance of the Father, therefore fully deity, we know he is self-sufficient and self-existent. Christ needs nothing. But the bride is the Father's love gift to the Son. Now usually we emphasize that the Son is the Father's love gift to the world. And we emphasize that because we love John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So yes, we affirm it that the Son is the Father's love gift to the world. But let's not forget that the bride is the Father's love gift to the Son. And Jesus prayed that great prayer in John 17, 24. Father, Father, I, I desire. Oh, it's a strong Greek word here. I desire. Father, I desire that they whom you gave me will be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, this is the serious business of heaven today. The Spirit working, forming a bride for God's Son. A bride who will forever share an intimate companionship with Christ, the bride who will forever live in the honeymoon suite of the universe, the new Jerusalem, 
the bride who will forever dazzle the hosts of the heavens with her splendor and glory and beauty, the sent servant. Well, let's proceed. It's a great story. Number two, let's talk about the sovereign selection. Because Jesus said it. Those you gave me. This is the work of God. Now, the servant started the journey. He went back to the hometown of Abraham. And boy, he was burdened. Am I going to do a good job finding a girl? And he prayed. And he trusted God. And Abraham had already assured him, the angel of the Lord will go before you. You're not on your own here. You're not just on a wild goose chase. I've given you an assignment, but the angel of the Lord will go before you and guide your steps. And so, a servant, be encouraged by the providential leading of the Lord. And sure enough, the angel of the Lord led this servant to a particular well. And so, the servant gets to this well, and he thinks, you know, this is where it's going to happen. So, he bows his head and he prays. And he says, God, you know what, I'm going I'm to put out a little test right here. All the damsels that come to this well to draw out water. Um, I mean, how will I know the chosen one? I mean, how can I find that out? Let's do a little test, God, so you can show me your choice. The girl who comes to me and takes the initiative and gives me something to drink, and then she's willing to give drink to my ten camels. Let that be the one that you've chosen as the bride. And so, after the prayer, the servant just sits there. And all girls are coming in and out. It's a busy noon hour as all the young ladies fill their buckets and pitchers and go back to the house. And everybody's pretty much ignoring him. He's a stranger, he's weird, just sitting there, Googling at everybody, staring. Everybody's getting freaked out a little bit. The girls are rushing in and rushing out. But there was one young lady who paused and looks over to the servant and walks over to him and says, Hello, you seem to be thirsty. Can I get you something to drink? Why, yes, I, I am thirsty. And she dips down and gets him a nice drink of water. And then she looks at this fleet of camels, and she is willing to give satisfaction to all of the camels. Now, that's no small task. A camel drinks five gallons. Now, you do the math. Five times ten, 50 gallons of water. And this was the day before spigots. I mean, she had to draw by hand, draw that water out of the well. Fifty gallons pulling up out of the well to quench the thirst of all of these camels. Oh, but you see, she is demonstrating her character, isn't it? What, what kind of character is she showing here? Humility, hospitality, kindness, sensitivity, thoughtfulness, servanthood, a work ethic. All the qualities that go into a good wife. You know what? You never know when you're being tested. In, in the ordinary routine of life, you never know when you're under surveillance and you're being scouted. You don't know. A famous line says, make every occasion a great occasion for you can never tell when someone may be taking your measurements for a larger place. Well, she passed the test. Her character is just so kind. And he's just thrilled because this is what he set up with God. And so he's like, oh, hallelujah. Not all of them passed me by. Not all of them ignored me. Somebody fit the description of what I prayed about. I love it. Thank you, God. And surely this is the one. I have a friend by the name of Billy Tuttle. This is so 
funny. Uh, this happened years ago when Billy was um, single, and he was very desirous of a, a wife. He didn't have the gift of celibacy. So he was praying about a woman. And he told me. He called me and said, Tim, I prayed and God told me I'm going to meet my wife at the well. And he was thinking about Genesis 24. And I'm like, well, hallelujah. I said, what does that mean? He said, oh, I'm not sure. I think it means church, the well, the woman at the well, church. I said, that sounds like a good application. And so Billy loved church anyway, but now that he got that rhema word, boy, he was there early. I wonder what pew she's sitting on. I mean, she just, he's just looking around. And sure enough, sure enough, right after that phone call from him, he met a girl by the name of Jean. They dated and got married right there at church, the Edgemere Church of God in Baltimore, Maryland. And so after they started dating, I called Billy, and I said, well, congratulations. I heard God really did speak to you. You met your woman at the well. Yeah. Yeah. And her name is what, Jean? Yeah, Jean, uh, Jean Atwell. I said, what? I said, her name is, Billy said his, her name is Jean Atwell. I said, Billy, God didn't tell you you're going to meet her at the well. He told you her name. It's Atwell. He said, well, what about that? He did. He called her by name. But you know what? God cares about these things. And when it comes to decisions like this, a lifelong partner, sometimes we don't know what we need and really what we want. But the angel of the Lord can go before you and guide you. And that's what happened with this servant. Oh, God was involved and in showing him the choice, God's choice, for this woman to be Isaac's bride. And I want to tell you the spirit of the Lord, the sent servant, he's working through the world today to find a bride for Christ, and that discovery is still being made at the well. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be a part of the bride of Christ? Then you have to pass the water test. Well, what is the water test? It's, it's Acts 2.38, where Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is the water test? It's Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. What is the water test? It's John chapter 3, verse 5, where Jesus said, you must be born again. He said, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. And so basically, you have to be born from above. You have to put your faith in that crimson fountain that flows from the old rugged cross and then express that faith in Christian water baptism. And the fact is, God is still finding his bride at the well. There was a sovereign selection. Oh, there's more to the story. It gets gooder. Number three, let's talk about a serious solicitation. Well, the servant introduces himself to Rebecca as she does this display of kindness at the well. And then he's invited into her daddy's house. Bethuel was his name. And that gets down to serious business now because the servant sits down with mom and dad to get the permission. He's got to make his proposal to mom and dad. And so he talks about the greatness of Abraham. He talks about how Isaac is the heir of all these riches, spiritual and natural how Abraham is in covenant with God and a partaker of divine promises. Now notice, the servant did not badger the bachelorette. The servant did not push and intimidate. This was no shotgun wedding here. This servant simply presented the facts and said, you know what, this is a good opportunity. And if Rebecca misses it, she's the loser. 
She, she don't know what she's going to miss out on if she lets this blessing pass her by. He said, Abraham's a blessed man. He is a friend of God, and uh, Isaac is the heir of all of these things. Rebecca has an opportunity to enter into a spiritual family, a prosperous family, a, a significant family as it relates to the kingdom of God. That's all the servant said. He just talked about Abraham and Isaac. Well, Bethuel listened and finally said, well, that sounds pretty good to me. He says, you got my blessing and you got my approval. Yes, Rebecca can be the bride. But then something weird happened. After everything was settled and the, the proposal was accepted, then the family said, but wait a minute, let's wait 10 days. Let us have Rebecca for 10 days before her departure. Well, I, that sounded reasonable, but what may sound reasonable to us may be a, a demonic distraction. And the servant sensed something negative about this. He sensed that there was something potentially dangerous about this, that this, this hesitation would be harmful. And so the servant insisted and said, oh, no, no, there could be no delays here. There can't be 10 days. God is right now prospering my journey, and we can't hesitate. We got to stick with it. We, we got to be aggressive. We, we got to stay the course. We, we, we can't have a 10-day retreat here. I'm feeling that right now God is blessing what we're doing. And we got to stay with it. And so the family was like, well, we'll let Rebecca speak for herself. We want her for 10 days. And so they bring Rebecca into the little living room and sit her down. And they say, uh, all right, are you going to go with this servant now? What are you going to do? It's now or never, apparently. And she said... I will go. I'm going to go with him. Now, that may have been a little bit deflating and disappointing to mom and dad because really, in this case, she is choosing Isaac over them. But you know what? That's an essential part of marriage, a successful marriage, cutting the apron strings. And Jesus said, you got to leave mother and father and cleave to your new man that's leave and cleave there can't be outside interference and Rebecca felt it and she made a firm choice she said I will go the Holy Spirit is moving in the world today building a bride for Christ and he's going to individuals and bringing them to a point of decision will you follow Christ no coercion, no intimidation, just a simple testimony. That's what the Spirit does. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will testify of me. The Spirit simply tells the story about how good God is, how precious Christ is, tells the story, and then gives the invitation. Will you follow Christ? But sometimes a commitment to Christ is difficult because there's distractions and there are pressures. And sometimes it's your own family that hinders you from making a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus said that if you don't love me more than you love mom and dad and brother and sister, then you're not worthy of me. You see, the devil will always say 10 more days, but delay is devilish. Delay is disastrous. When the Spirit says to get up and follow, we must respond. Somehow when we come up with excuses and justifications to, to get ten more days, the impulses of the Spirit are deadened and dulled, and we become entrenched in this distance from God. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart. Well, i got to pull up my pants or we're going to have a problem. Jesus, help me. 
Well, the story gets gooder. <laughs> Let's talk for a moment about number four, a spectacular shower. Abigail just had her bridal shower. All kind of gifts. She was listing all the gifts. Well, you read about it in the chapter because now that Rebecca makes her choice and mom and dad approve, it's a done deal. Before they head back to Canaan, now the servant sponsors a big party. And it's not just for girls. You read where the guys are there. They drink too much, but they're there at the party too. And they're feasting and gifts, gifts. Oh, I mean the servant went over to the bags that were draped over the back of the camels and pulled out clothes and jewelry and gold, the Bible says. You see, Rebecca didn't realize what she was signing up for when she said, I will go. She didn't realize what she was going to enter into, the riches and the glory of this relationship of Abraham and Isaac. She couldn't imagine it at this point. And so the servant wants to give her a little sampling of the rich inheritance. And the servant wants to give a little taste of what she was getting ready to enter into, a little preview, a little tangible preview of how great Abraham really is and how great Isaac really is. And so there's gifts, all these gifts. Oh, what a party. Did she try on her clothes? I think she did. I, I think she did. I think she tried on her clothes and got in front of the three-way mirror and the family. Oh, that looks good on you, darling. Ooh, that fits you nice. Does it look good from here? Oh, yes, it does. She tried on her clothes. I, I think she took the, the, the bracelet and slapped it on her wrist and, 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 be, and it glittered. Oh, look at this bracelet. It's so expensive. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe this is a gift. It's mine. And, and then a necklace strung, being strung around her shoulders and, and, and she's seeing it reflecting in the light and everybody is ooh and ah. All of these gifts. Did she put the gold ring, the diamond ring on her finger? and flash it around. Oh, she was getting a little taste, a little sampling of what she was getting ready to enter into. The Holy Spirit is working in the world today. He's building a bride. That's, that's the serious business of heaven. The servant of God, the Holy Spirit, is working in the world today, building a bride for God's eternal son. And you know what? When, when individuals say, you know, I'm signing up for this. I'm following Jesus. The Holy Spirit begins to give gifts and treasures so that we can begin to experience a, in a small degree what we're going to have in heaven one day. And so the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Another figure, the Holy Spirit is the first fruit of our eternal harvest of happiness. So not only does the Holy Spirit give us the pledge that it all is going to be revealed to us and shared with us, but the Holy Spirit is actually a foretaste and we get to enjoy a little bit of heaven on our way to heaven. And so the Holy Spirit gives us depths of joy. The Holy Spirit gives us measures of peace that is supernatural. The peace of God that passes all understanding and the world can't figure it out. It's a peace that doesn't come from a pill bottle and a peace that doesn't come from the psychiatrist's couch, but it's the peace of God through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit it gives us strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the Holy Spirit gives us power. And we have gifts of the Spirit. We have supernatural power to do something special for God. And the Holy Spirit gives us these beautiful experiences with the Lord Jesus Christ. Where Christ is so wonderful to us and so real to us. So what is the Holy Spirit doing? What is the servant doing? Just giving us everyday gifts. Everyday gifts to make us know that our wedding appointment is a solid hope. 
Heaven is a real thing, and our Christian journey is a sure path, and it makes me want to turn to that hymn book and sing. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. I don't want to look back. I don't want to give up. Sometimes the way gets hard, but the Holy Spirit is throwing me a shower every day. The Holy Spirit is unfolding gifts every day. And I partake of the treasures of God. Bless his holy name. Maybe somebody will give me new suspenders. <laughs> and then finally, in closing this message, let's talk about, hey, let's talk about a satisfying sight. I want you to see this in closing. I want you to see this. Folks, this is a bridal church. Let's celebrate the church. It's the bridal church. That's why we need to protect the unity of the church. Christ is not coming for a harem. He's coming for a bride. <laughs> Love the church. Celebrate the local church. It's a bridal church. Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. Well, the shower is over. Rebecca is just decked out. Jewels, rings, new wardrobe. And now they start their journey to Canaan to meet Isaac. A two-month journey. It'll take two months for Rebecca and the servant to get from the house of Bethuel to the house of Abraham. Now, would you please imagine with me that two-month journey? What was it like getting ready for this wedding? Two-month journey. You think they talked a lot, Rebecca and the servant? You think Rebecca had a lot of questions? You think that at night, sitting around the campfire, Rebecca would say, now, what did you say he looks like? <laughs> Tall, dark, and handsome? Short and cute? Bald? Can he cook? Is he strong? Can he fix cars? Does he have a pretty smile? Is he kind? Tell me about him. You know him, servant. You know Isaac. Tell me about him. I mean, I'm going to be married to this man. Tell me more. I, I need to know. How rich is he? <laughs> really? How rich is he? He's got more than these few treasures. And you know what? The servant. Two months, the servant is just talking about Isaac. Yeah, he's wonderful. He's wonderful. You're going to be so happy. And she's like, oh, my goodness, I, I just can't wait to meet him. I mean, the, the two-month journey, she's learning more and more. And the anticipation is building. And the excitement is growing. And she's forgetting all about what she left behind. Is anybody hearing me preach right now? She, I mean, the family has faded from view. Her old lifestyle doesn't even matter anymore. As she gets closer to Canaan, and, and that new home becomes such a reality, and she's enjoying the gifts. I mean, the whole too much, she's just looking at all the gold and the treasures, and she's thinking about being in the arms of this wonderful man, Isaac, for two months. And then, finally, there's Isaac. They get there. Now, Isaac, his personality is to be meditative. He's quiet. And he's not like his son Jacob, you know. He's a little more calm. And he's out in the field. The sun is sinking. The shadows are lengthening. And he's walking in the field, just relaxing in the Father's presence, waiting for the bride. He's enjoying a lovely evening, watching the sunset. Don't you love that? Isn't that the greatest time of the day, watching a sunset? And there he is, just, oh, God, you're so good. Look at that sunset. Then he sees the camels. He sees the caravan. And he's like, ooh, his heart jumped. My bride. My bride is coming. 
my bride. And, and he stands still, and it gets closer, and he's straining his eyes. And then Rebecca gets so close now, Rebecca dismounts and veils herself. And then the servant escorts Rebecca to Isaac. Sir Isaac, I want you to meet somebody. I want you to meet this beautiful young lady named Rebecca. And it was love at first sight. You know what? Our Christian journey, it might be two months, but most of it is, it might be a 20-year journey for you. It might be a 70-year journey. And you know what? We walk by faith, not by sight. Because Peter said, we love him, but we've never seen him. You've never seen Jesus Christ. You've never peered into his eyes. You've never literally heard his voice and touched his frame. You've never seen him. But Peter says, you love him. Why do we love him when we've never seen him? Because in this journey, we have a traveling companion, the servant of God, the Holy Spirit, who is constantly teaching us about Christ who is constantly showing us the things of Christ. For Jesus said, the Spirit will take the things of mine and show them to you. And so every day, we're learning more about Christ. And we're falling in love with Him as more gifts are given to us and treasures are unveiled to us. And it's all about Jesus. And one day, the Spirit is going to take us out of this world translate us out of this world, transport us into the heavenlies, and we're going to see him. The veil is going to be lifted. Now we see through a dark, dimly. We see through a glass, dimly. There's a veil. But we're going to see him face to face. Now, in closing, here's what's interesting. Did you see it? Genesis 22 is the chapter we all love, the dress rehearsal for Calvary. When Isaac, again, a type of Christ, is placed on the altar to be sacrificed, that's chapter 22. And miraculously, he was spared, which is kind of like a resurrection, Romans 4 says. So what happens two chapters later? After Isaac is so-called put to death and resurrected, what, what do we see him next? We see him in chapter 24 reposing in the Father's presence, just waiting for the bride. Can I tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ was placed on the altar, the cross, and put to death, and he was raised from the dead, and he ascended? What is he doing right now? He's, he's reposing. He's sitting. He's sitting in the Father's presence, meditating, waiting for his bride. And I want to tell you, when the Holy Spirit escorts us into the presence of the Son of the living God, everybody's going to be happy. We're going to be satisfied with what we see Amen. when we see Him. When, we, when our faith becomes sight and we see the one who died for us and we see our bridegroom, we're not going to be disappointed, but we won't even be able to catch our breath because He is altogether lovely. He is brighter than the noonday sun. And we're going to see him as he is. And we're going to be so happy. But he's going to like what he sees. Oh, when Isaac saw Rebecca, oh, I'm now comforted that mama is gone. I, I, can, I can stop crying over mama because I got a new mama. Come here, darling. He was so happy with Rebecca. Oh, you are beautiful. You may say, really, Christ is going to look at his bride and be happy with what he sees? Look at the church world today with all of its failures and, and all of its fumbling and all of its chaos and misunderstandings. Really? Christ is going to be pleased with what he sees in his bride? Oh, yes, he will. Because the Bible says that when we see him, we will be like him 
for we will see him as he is. What's going to happen is when we actually see Christ face to face, there's going to be an instant miracle of glorification so that Ephesians 5 says that every blemish is going to go, every spot is going to be removed, every wrinkle is going to disappear, everything about us that we feel is ugly and unbecoming and unattractive is all going to disappear and we are going to become instantly the most gorgeous creature that ever breathed life in the universe. We're going to be the glorious, radiant, perfect, beautiful, holy, loving bride of Christ. And he is going to love his bride. He's going to be happy with his bride. Oh, Isaac took Rebecca into his tent. And I want to tell you, Christ is going to take his bride into the new Jerusalem. I mean a four square city that has 12 foundations and 12 gates of pearl and walls of jasper. That's the honeymoon suite. And forever we shall be with the Lord. Let's stand and give God praise in this house. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Here comes the bride. Everyone in silent prayer right now. The sun is sinking. The Bible says that at the end of the age... There's going to be a downturn in society. There's going to be a, a darkening. For 2,000 years, the church has made a positive impact on society, and there's been improvement in the world. But somehow, at the end of the age, the sun is going to start sinking. And we see that. We see the sinking of the sun and the, the darkness gathering. But that means... The bride is getting ready to be presented to the bridegroom. And then there's going to be a new day and a new dawn. I hope that when we think about Bible prophecy, we're not just thinking about Antichrist and Armageddon and, and bowls of wrath. I know that's serious judgment stuff, but listen, that doesn't apply to us. We're the bride of Christ. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. It's been interesting talking to my girls all summer because Elisa now is married. She's on cloud nine. Oh, Daddy, he's so wonderful. Christopher, so wonderful. I'm married. Yay. Abigail's getting married at Elvis Presley birthplace July the 7th or 6th. I don't know. Coming up. I told her, I said, are we going to sing You Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog? Is that, is that why we're going to Elvis Presley birthplace? Oh, but she's so excited, texting me every day. They don't call me anymore. I'm deaf. I can't hear a thing they say. They gave up on calling, Daddy. They text me now. Oh, Daddy. It, Abigail says it, it three weeks, two weeks. She's counting the days. Oh, I got the dress. She's sending me pictures, things she's trying on. Folks, this should be a time of excitement. We're the bridal church. We're the bride of Christ. He comes. The bridegroom is coming. And beloved, we can't even imagine the intimacy with Christ, the closeness, the enviable position we will have throughout all of eternity as peoples and planets and angels will stare at us and go, really? You got, you got to be the bride? Oh, what a blessing. As we pray, I, I quote the end of the Bible, the end of the book. How does the Bible end? With an invitation, the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. Don't miss out on this. The spirit, the servant of God right now is calling you. Are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to fo follow doesn't matter what your parents think and what your neighbors think. Are you going to follow Christ? You have a choice to make today. God, take this message. 
take this message, this gospel about a wedding, and let it have great impact on our lives today. Don't let us walk away and dismiss this as a, a fantasy film and a fictional fairy tale. God, this is so real. It's so real. The Spirit is working today, God, the servant of God. Oh, that we would accept the call. Meet him at the well. Be baptized in water, putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Some of you, it's your day to be saved. It's that simple. It's your day to be saved. Sovereignly, God, because of his choice, is going to save you. And you're going to have power to choose him because he's choosing you. We're going to ask you to pray, but we're going to empower you to pray. I'm going to ask the whole church to say a prayer with me. And you join in, and God's going to hear you today. Church, pray after me. Dear God, I recognize my need of you. I confess that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. And he is alive today and forevermore. Forgive my sins and bring me into your family. Amen. Clap your hands. Let's rejoice. Let's rejoice. Soon and very soon. We are going to see it. Help us sing now soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Soon and 